I don't just have to do. Okay, uh, John 3. So, so far we've looked at uh, John chapters 1 and 2. And what we've noticed all throughout, beginning in chapter 1, is that Jesus pre-existed. And in John chapter 1, there's a man named John the Baptist who testifies that Jesus is the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. And the prophecies that are applied to John the Baptist come from two different major Old Testament prophecies that have to do with the restoration of Israel and judgment. Then in the latter half of chapter 1, all of Jesus' disciples uh, recognize that Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied about long ago, right? And so uh, they even recognize he's the son of David. He is the prophet that's come into the world and all these things. And so in chapter uh, 2, there's uh, two major things that happen. First, Jesus attends a wedding. Um, he attends a wedding and he turns water to wine. And I pointed out to you how uh, that kind of goes back to Isaiah 1 where their wine had become diluted. And then in the end of chapter 2, and so, so, uh, so turning the water to wine was a way to talk about the restoring of Israel. And then at the end of chapter 2, Jesus says, destroy the temple, I'll build it again in three days, indicating uh, something first about his death and resurrection, but ultimately talking about his, uh, him being the chief cornerstone of the new covenant temple. So, let's look at John chapter 3. And now Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, has all of this in the back of his mind whenever he approaches Jesus. They're trying to figure out not just if he is a teacher that comes from God, but if he is the teacher. They want to know if he's the prophet. And so Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews, one of Jesus' disciples that actually assisted in his burial and preparations for his burial, he is, uh, he, here he is coming to Jesus by night. And the reason, of course, you know, we talk about, a lot of people talk about why, G, why he came to Jesus by night is because he didn't want to be seen talking with Jesus. So this is uh, John chapter two, 3 and verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And up to this point, what Nicodemus has in mind is uh, John's, rather, is, uh, is Jesus turning the water into wine. And we've already pointed out how there were other signs that Jesus was doing at this time, but these were the ones that John picked out and numbered them to teach us something about the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus knows, and in fact he says, we know, so uh, indicating that him and the other Pharisees know, even if they weren't vocal about it, that the signs that Jesus was doing were legitimate. Now eventually what they're going to do is they're going to try to say that the signs that Jesus was doing uh, were really illegitimate because uh, he was doing them you know, by the power of the devil, right? And so they do end up trying to sort of twist that in a way to, to demonize Jesus. Um, but at this point, Nicodemus says, look, we know that you're a teacher from God. You're doing the signs, you know, there's not really any disputing that. Now, the reason why Nicodemus approaches Jesus is, be, and this isn't said specifically in the text, but it's been talked about up to this point in chapters 1 and 2. That is, the Nicodemus wants to know, is Jesus the Messiah? Is he the one that's going to set up the kingdom? Is he the one that's going to bring in this new heavens and new earth of Isaiah 65 and 66, restore Israel, all these things, right? So that's what Nicodemus is really coming for. And Jesus knows why Nicodemus is approaching him. And so what he does is he doesn't talk about what Nicodemus wants him to talk about. He talks about uh, sort of a first step that Nicodemus would have to take to even be able to discuss the things that what, what he really wanted to discuss. I'll, tell you, I'll show you about that here in a second. So Jesus answered, Jesus answered and said, which means there is a, there's, there's more to this than what meets the eye. There's questions behind Nicodemus' statement that Jesus knew, and anybody reading this in the first century would have known. The obvious questions. Are you the Messiah? When's the kingdom going to be set up? 
When's, what's the sign of the coming and the, end of your, and the end of the age? Is the kingdom of God going to appear immediately? You know, all these questions that they actually asked Jesus throughout his ministry are behind this statement that he makes, understanding that Jesus had come from God. Because remember, John didn't do any signs, but Jesus did do signs. So Jesus answers and says to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again or from above, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the expression cannot see is really a, a subtle reference to the nature of the kingdom, isn't it? Because being able to see, there's different ways you can see. You can see with your physical eyes, but you can see and in that you intuit and that you know and that you've experienced, right? Uh, and so he says, I cannot, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says, unless one is born again, which I mentioned when I read that, means from above is what the word again means there in that passage. If you look at your center column reference, oftentimes it'll have a little marker indicating that that word can be translated from above. So he has to be born again. And Nicodemus is immediately confused. Well, I don't think Nicodemus was actually confused by this statement. I think that what he was doing was asking questions to get more information. I think he knew that, what, that Jesus wasn't saying, you've got to go back into your mother's womb and be born. That's obvious. I think what Nicodemus was doing was saying, okay, what do you mean by that, really? I know you're not talking about this. See, you kind of get the sense. Because who, Nic Nicodemus wouldn't think that Jesus is saying, you've got to go back into your mother's womb and be born. Really? Yeah. Okay. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? See, it's, he's, it's a rhetorical question. I think he's saying you, nobody can be reborn from their mother, mother's womb if they're old and if they're a grown man. I'm, I'm looking at less than what Nicodemus was saying, but how Jesus took him and his reply to him. What do you mean? He, he's, he brings out the point later on down, down the road, you know, or he asks him, are you a teacher of the Jews and you don't know these things? Right. Well, I think he was confused, and he didn't catch exactly what was going on. Well, he didn't, he didn't know what Jesus meant by being born again, but he knew that it, it couldn't mean going back into your mother's womb and being reborn. Like, I think that, that last question he asks, he asks, how can a man be born when he is old? And then the second question, he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So I think there he's, he knows that's an impossibility, but he's, he's asking the question to get the answer, you know? Like, he... Kind of like what Jesus did on multiple occasions. Jesus would ask questions to get more information, to get better, more answers. I think Jesus would, th would teach things, and they had spiritual, had spiritual meanings. Right. And all they could really grasp and catch was the physical, what they could see physically. Right. I think when you talk about, you know, his body, tear his, uh, tear his temple down. Right. And I'll raise it up in three days. We know he wasn't talking about the physical temple. Right. He stop the temple of his body. But they didn't get that because all they could dwell on was this temple. So, what they saw. So in this case, Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus means. He right. doesn't. He doesn't know what he means by it. Right. But he knows that a literal interpretation of what Jesus means doesn't make any sense either. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he knows that. Somebody can't be actually reborn like that. They're biologically impossible. How would that even work, right? right? So what he knows is the literal interpretation is impossible, but he doesn't know what to replace that with. Right. So, so when he's, he's stuck. He, right, he's stuck. So he says, he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? That's like a rhetorical question. Of course not. So what's the answer? You know, what's the solution? Is the way I read it. When, when, I, when, I meant say, when I said he wasn't confused, I meant he didn't actually believe that somebody could be physically reborn. He's just trying to get more information to see what, what the answer is. He doesn't know the solution to the riddle, right? Um, the interesting thing about this, of course, is a lot of times in the prophets, they talk about being circumcised of heart, you know, and creating me a clean heart, oh God, and all these sorts of things, which is why Jesus is critical of him because mm -hmm. he didn't understand, you know, he wasn't familiar enough with those types of things to know what was really going on. But you would have thought that when he, when he made mention, he clarifies, his, his remarks that he was one a teacher, one that taught Israel, taught 
and that, you know, we should have known these things by right. what you're saying. Study in the scriptures. The scriptures they mention of of uh, uh, these these things all the time. And right. You think somebody that studied the scriptures, and I'm think thinking that Nicodemus was a, was was a, was really devout and really really studied the scriptures and knew knew the scriptures, but yet he missed those those points. Yeah, Johnny. Well, it talks about it all the time. I mean, well, spiritual nature. Yeah, we'll get into that. We'll get to we'll get into that here in a second. I got a, a passage for you from Ezekiel that we'll go to. But uh, so, G, what Jesus' response is in verse five is, "Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God." Now, I've heard some people talk about verse five. Say it's the uh, like amniotic fluid that the baby's born with, but uh, typically that's that's a way to try to get around uh, the act of baptism is all. But there's actually Old Testament passage about this. Let's go back all the way to Ezekiel chapter 36. Look at verse uh, 25 through 27. Ezekiel 36. We'll actually begin in verse 24 uh, just to add in that little restoration of Israel uh, tidbit there. He's Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27. Okay, he says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Now as you're reading that, keep in mind what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that a great trumpet would be blown, and his angels would gather the elect, from one end of heaven to the other, right? If you, if you remember that passage from Matthew 24, 31. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. There's, there's being born again. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Go to uh, chapter 37 as well, just real quick. Uh, verse, chapter, well, go back to 36. I got to show you two more passages here uh, from verse 33. He says, Thus says the Lord God, Ezekiel 36, 33, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. But when will their iniquity be taken away? When, when would Israel's iniquity be taken away? Right, so you have, you have Jesus' uh, Jesus's cross is the means through which the iniquity, iniquity be, would taken. <laughs> Jesus' cross is the means through which iniquity be, would, would be taken away. But if you think back uh, to add to that, to complement it, in uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 through 27, we have this said. He says, I do not want... You, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, The deliverer will come from Zion, who will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now that, uh, that passage that he quotes, <laughs> this is kind of getting... Uh, a little, little more complicated than I intended. But that passage that Paul's quoting there in Romans 11 is from Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 9, which talks about the iniquity be, would be taken away when they were judged, when the altars turned into chalk stone, and they're brought back from all the nations. So think about the iniquity being taken away like this in stages. Jesus' cross was the way and the means by which their iniquity is taken away. But it wasn't until the gospel was spread to the whole nations and Israel was judged and that which polluted the land was cast out 
that that process was complete in that sense, in that national sense. In terms of Jesus' death on the cross, that's the means by which sins were forgiven, but it was the judgment that purified and cleansed and took out the imperfections out of the kingdom and cast them into the fire, right? And so that's, that, and, that, and you, you see that uh, all throughout the prophets. Judgment and salvation are closely linked. But Jesus' sacrifice is the means by which the sins would be forgiven and the standard by which Israel would be judged, whether or not they accepted the message of the cross. Okay, uh, go back to uh, chapter 37 real quick of Ezekiel, and I want to show you uh, one more passage from there, around about verse 14, um, just to bring this to your memory. He says, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I'll place you on your own land then you'll know that I the Lord has spoken and done it declares the Lord Ezekiel 37 14 in the context of that passage he talks about a remnant being saved and then being resurrected uh, dry bones coming to life coming up out of their graves and he says that that would be fulfilled in a time when Israel was restored when he would put his spirit within them so now that we've read those passages Let's go back to John chapter 3, look down here again uh, to verse 5, and let's read what Jesus said once more. So John chapter 3 and verse 5, let's read it again. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So when you read that, now you have the background of Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37. So you can see as the wheels start to turn about how he's talking about the restoration of Israel and them being purified from their sins, uh, like, like the waters that were used in the purification rituals in the Old Covenant. And what symbolized that, as we saw, uh, as, you, as you see in John's ministry, and as you see in Jesus' ministry at the end of this chapter, what symbolized that rebirth was baptism. And this is why the Ethiopian eunuch, and why those on the day of Pentecost, and why the household of Cornelius were told to submit to a baptism of water, because it symbolizes in pictures this uh, being you know, purified with water and being filled with the Spirit. It's a, as we talked about before, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so what, he, what he's telling them there in verse 5 is, you've got to receive that new heart and that new spirit and be transformed by the Spirit if you're going to enter the kingdom of God. And notice that entering the kingdom of God is equated to uh, seeing the kingdom of God in verse 3. Entering the kingdom of God is equated to seeing the kingdom of God. So whenever, we, uh, whenever somebody doesn't, doesn't get it, it's typically because they haven't entered the kingdom of God. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when you talk about the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ is foolishness to those that perish. Okay? But those who have accepted it, it's the, word, you know, it's the words of life. It's wisdom from above. And so from the outside looking in, you can't see it. You don't get it. But once you enter into it, then you know, then you, you can see it, then you realize what it is. And that's why it's worse for an individual who comes in and later goes out than it is for someone who's never in to begin with. Because the person who goes in and goes out knows what, what it is and knows what they're leaving behind, right? And so unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says he cannot enter the kingdom of God in verse 5. So what he's telling Nicodemus is, before they ever even have a discussion of, uh, of these heavenly things, as he's going to call them in a second, he's got to go ahead and fix what he, need, what he needs to fix right now, which is uh, uh, opening up to having a new heart and a new spirit, being, re, uh, being transformed and being reborn through God, not of the will of flesh, but, but of God. Uh, go back to John chapter 1 just for a moment. Let me show you how this whole rebirth thing was sort of foreshadowed uh, in the previous chapter. In John 1, 13, uh, 1, 12 and 13, he says, As many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of flesh, nor the will, not, not, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. In other words, since they received him, it was then that they were able to see and to be born again and to enter the kingdom of God. They were able to be born of the will of God if they were willing to receive him. But when they rejected Jesus, even after seeing the signs, they were unable to 
uh, even they, they were unable to even see or even comprehend what Jesus was talking about in many cases. And that's why there's so much confusion and explanation that takes place in John because they hadn't yet been born from above. And this kind of indicates to us, and this is sort of, uh, uh, this is actually something I didn't think of until just now. Uh, when we ask the question, when were the disciples born again or born from above, it apparently wasn't before Jesus' death because they had misunderstandings up to the very end. Even Jesus meant when he said he was going to die and raise again the third day. But then after Jesus is raised, then they begin to understand all these things and know what's talking about. So apparently the disciples didn't even get it until after the, after the resurrection. Huh, I got to write that down for a second. I got to do a little something on that. I hadn't thought about that before. Thank you for teaching me that. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, disciples didn't get it before resurrection, born again. Okay, I got to do a little more thinking on that one too. Okay, uh, he says in verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, uh, this is a passage that we've talked about before, but this is a pretty simple formula. Um, and when you study the Apostle Paul, specifically uh, Galatians chapter 4 with the allegory, you know, the children of the promise are the children of the spirit versus the children of the flesh, okay? Um, you see what he's talking about here. It was one thing to be descended from Abraham physically, but it was another thing to have the faith of Abraham and be born as a child of Abraham under the new birth, okay? Uh, those born according to the flesh it didn't mean it meant something, but it didn't mean that they were guaranteed a place in the kingdom unless they were willing to be born from above, unless they submitted to God's will and uh, were willing to be born from above. And so John 6 sets up this sort of uh, formula. If an individual is born of the flesh and only of the flesh, then they're flesh. But if an individual is born of the spirit, then they're spirit. Now that's talking about the way that an individual uh, lives life. Do they live according to the flesh or do they live according to the spirit? And so uh, Jesus was born again in this way. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. In Romans chapter 1 verse 3 and 4, we have the two births of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was born according to the flesh through Mary, right? From uh, John 1, 14, the word became flesh. Here's what Romans 1, 3 says. Uh, concerning his son, who is born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. But then he says this in verse 4. Who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so on one hand, Jesus was born according to the flesh. But then he was declared to be the Son of God through his resurrection, through being born of the Spirit. And so uh, that's why in Acts 13, uh, Paul quotes that passage, You are my son, today I have begotten you, in reference to Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection was a new type of birth. Uh, it was him being born from above. It was him entering his place as the king in the kingdom of God. What you got? Explain that a little bit more. All right. Are you, saying, are you saying that he was not declared God's son until his resurrection from the dead? What does the word declared mean? Made known, pronounced. R right. And so the resurrection was the ultimate sign that he was God's son, that he was the son of God. But didn't God himself, long before the resurrection, he did. God proclaimed him? Right. Son? Right. So he, he said, uh, this is, you know, this is my son, hear ye him. Mm -hmm. Like on the Mount of Transfiguration, right. and at the, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. Like at the, at the uh, baptism of Jesus. But that, that fact was made manifest by his resurrection. And it was something that, uh, that's what they were witnesses to. Um, it was, that's, and that's what he says in Romans 1 4, who has declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So he had been declared the Son of God prior to that, 
at his baptism at the Mount of Transfiguration. But did Peter, Peter say that we witnessed this? We was with him there on the, on the mountain and witnesses? Right, we were, we were witnesses of his power and his... Uh, his, his uh, he said he heard the voice too. Right. And, his, and the voice declared him as the only begotten. That's right. And if Peter was completely sold by that and that alone, why did he deny him three times? But after the resurrection, just a couple of days, you know, after the resurrection, he was willing to die for Jesus. So what changed? Well, uh, that's a little, has, has a little, I mean, that has to do with Peter faith. Peter, All the disciples Peter, Peter forsook him and when fled. You converted, when you are converted. Right. But, your brother. but all the disciples forsook him and fled. I mean, they were out there fishing, thinking all hope was lost, you know. Walking back home on the road, all mopey and sad about what was going on, Conf confused. And while and mentioned in Matthew 28, he said uh, some believed, but some were doubting. So even as he was, you know, even at that point, there were some that were still not completely sure what was going on. <laughs> but once his, once he sent the Spirit after his resurrection, and the Spirit was a was a was a pledge, you know, was a a, a seal of what had just happened, then it was undoubtable and they were willing to die for it. But it was his, it was his resurrection that sealed the deal for him, so to speak. <coughs> it because, because... I just never looked at it like that. I never... Yeah. Well, Peter witnessed everything that Jesus did, all the miracles, all the signs. And, what, and we probably say that sometimes. Well, Lord, if I just saw a sign like they saw a sign, then surely I would just, you know, right. be completely sold. But apparently not, you know. Mm -hmm. Because Peter saw all the signs, everybody saw all the signs, and yet Matthew twenty six says all disciples forsook him and fled. Now later on, Peter catches up to go watch, and John catches up to go watch. But initially, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, boom, they all scatter like sheep. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it wasn't until Jesus' resurrection that that core group had their faith really solidified and were willing to die for him. At that point, that's that's when they were sold, completely sold. So, so look at uh, look at Acts thirteen, just for a brief second. Um, Acts thirteen. Look at verse thirty three. Acts thirteen thirty three. He says that uh, God has fulfilled this promise to our children, in that He raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So Paul applied this psalm to Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus was born again. Now let me let me show you another passage that kind of goes along with this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Now this passage should make more sense to us. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. He says. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. He's not talking about Jesus' skin there. He's talking about the type of covenant that he was under. They had known Jesus according to the flesh. They had known the Christ according to the flesh. But once Jesus was born again, what Jesus said was, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Once he's born again... They don't know him in that world any longer, so they got to go to him out of that world and into the world above. So, and that's why he says in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. They didn't know Jesus according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. And so, if they wanted to know him, they had to be born again, born from above. They had to be, uh, they had to be transformed into the new creation through Jesus' birth, uh, rather, through their rebirth. Uh, because of Jesus' death and resurrection. So, going back to John uh, 3, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. Uh, in order for them to enter into the world above, and to, to enter in the new creation, to enter in the kingdom, which all those are just various ways of describing the same ideas, um, they had to be reborn. And this fact here sets up why there's so much misunderstanding in the book of John is because those people weren't willing to open up their mind and to, to submit to this new birth. Now, uh, anybody have any uh, 
comments or questions up to verse 6 so far. We still got one more thing I want to do in verse 6 before we move on. All right. Paul says something basically, not, not word for word, but, you know, basically the same as what's being said here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. This passage really makes more sense after studying what we just looked at. He says, Now say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Well, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. The new birth of John 3 is, is, is about preparing one to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus was born again at his resurrection, right? And so the new birth of John 3 is all about resurrection. It's really what it's talking about. It's talking about passing from death to life. To be in the flesh is death, but to be in the spirit is life and peace, is what uh, Paul talks about in Romans 8. And so the new birth is really what, what Jesus means when he talks about resurrection and what Paul means when he talks about resurrection, being fit for the new creation. One day we'll eventually study 1 Corinthians, and we'll get to chapter 15, and we're going to go through all these passages. Maybe, maybe we'll do 1 Corinthians after we finish Romans. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, this is what Paul's talking about. He's talking about a transformation from the flesh to the spirit. And uh, a lot of people miss that because they, they read into it a lot of, uh, you know, individual expectations when it's talking about the, trans, the transformation in more of a world than it is individuals. But, of course, individuals make up the world, so it's not mutually exclusive. But the focus is on a, a, a bigger change than just from an individual type of person to another individual. So 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus is saying in John 3. You can't enter, in other words, you can't inherit the kingdom of God unless you're born of the Spirit, because right now you're born of the flesh. And as long as you're born of flesh, you can't get in the kingdom of God that way. So you've got to be born again. You've got to be born from above, is what we should be saying, born from above, because that's going to make way more sense whenever we get to uh, the end of John chapter 3, which is going to send us back to 1 Corinthians 15. But we'll look at that. Uh, you said we won't study uh, maybe after maybe after Romans. Go for it. Sure. Sure. He says, "Behold, I tell you a mystery." Okay. So this is. Uh, there's more to this than meets the eye, in other words. He says, we will not all sleep, but we shall, we will all, we shall all be changed. Now, here's, the mystery, or here, here's what he's talking about. So, the big question on a lot of the Christian's mind, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, for example, is they were worried because they thought that Christians who were persecuted and died prior to the coming of the Lord were going to miss out on something, Right? And so Paul's point in 1 Thessalonians 4 is, it doesn't matter if you're awake, that is alive. It doesn't matter if you're asleep, that is dead. We all live together with him, right? So those that are dead don't miss out on anything. Those that are alive don't miss out on anything. Everybody lives together with Christ. Everybody has all spiritual blessings, dead and alive. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says this, we will not all sleep, which means not all of us are going to die. Some of them would, would die, but not all of them. Which is what Jesus said. Uh, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death till you see the kingdom come with power. Okay? And so he says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Meaning that both those who were alive and those who were dead would receive the same benefit, uh, would, receive the same, uh, would receive the same inheritance of the kingdom of God. Those that died beforehand because they were persecuted and died didn't mean that they were going to miss out on it. And those that were alive weren't missing out on anything either. Everybody would receive it at the same time. And uh, when you look at one of the big questions in 1 Corinthians 15 is they're denying that a certain group would participate uh, in the resurrection. And that's what really Paul's, 
we don't have time to get in all this now. And so what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to say, no, everybody in covenant, dead or alive, gets this. Not just those who are alive and not just those who fall asleep, but everybody is, is the point. So uh, that should be comforting for us because we know that when our loved ones die, in a sense, they're still with us. Because Paul said, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, you live together with him. And so we should, you know, that should give us comfort knowing that our loved ones are still among us even if we don't see them, right? Uh, because we're all living in the presence of Christ. And so that's what he means there in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Not everybody would die before that would happen, but because they died, didn't mean that they're going to miss out on anything. Right, right, right. People in Paul's day, uh, the ch- people at the church at Corinth. <clears throat> and so whenever we're born, whenever we're born from above, whenever we're born again, in our uh, response to the gospel, uh, we take part in that transformation as well. We become new creatures and the old things passed away. But we'll talk, we'll talk about, uh, we'll do a whole class on First Corinthians after Romans. That might be a good one to follow up on. Okay. Uh, John 3, 7. John 3, 7. He says, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born from